All right, so welcome to this little demo. This one's on how to do red fur and also how to do glowing fur, how to uh, break up a subject, in this case our red squirrel, and create a uh, half of the uh, subject matter in high intense sunlight and the other half in a cache saddle. So it's a good one not only to learn how to do some, uh, some red, rich red fur, but also how to break up warms and cools and create that little bit of depth using light source or light depth, if you will. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the studio and I'll show you how I painted this little guy. So I started this painting by putting in a base color on the whole board. And what this is, is a, it's a neutral 50% color. And what I mean about that is it's about, uh, it's a selected color that's about halfway between my lightest light and my darkest dark. And the second thing I'm doing is I'm actually putting a gradation onto the board right now because I want to create a little bit of depth. And the background when we're finished is going to be really nondescript. It's not a lot going on back there. Most of our actions in our foreground. So to add a little bit of depth to a background, the easiest way to do that is create a gradated background. Now, when I say gradated background, I don't just mean going from a dark to light. I also mean going from a warm to a cool. So here, the top, it's it's going to be a more uh, bluish uh, purple, whereas the bottom is more of a browny purple. And the top's cool, the bottom's warm. Why am I doing that? Well, because when I start painting in my squirrel, which is very warm, it'll be against that cool background, which will really shoot that squirrel forward. So think about these little things when you're starting your painting. Do I really want to block in the whole board with a, uh, a unified color, which a lot of artists use, especially the uh, Southwestern artists, they like to uh, paint their whole canvas with a, a like a sepia tone and then paint on top of that. So painting on top of uh, um, a, a neutralized color that the whole board is painting and is not a novel idea or anything that I've invented. It's been used for quite a while and it is a great process for one, get re getting rid of the white of the board to creating a a subtle neutral color that uh, can unify the board and and three it I just kind of hinted towards that it creates a little bit of a unity and a little bit of a unified color that you let come through the board in certain areas that brings the whole painting together so as with any painting I do I like to start uh, off by placing in my uh, base colors my local colors and creating my shape and form. This is the uh, part of the painting where you can really establish uh, working out proportions, uh, color changes, warms, cools, darks, lights, all those little things that are so important to a painting, but people really tend to overlook and bypass. I see so many young artists at workshops jumping right into the detail right off the get-go before they've even established any kind of shape and form. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm establishing where the big value changes are, where the big color changes are, and where the big change between warms and cool are. And in this painting, warm and cool is just as important as dark and light because this painting is really based on the lighting. Let's bring up the, the reference that I, I'm painting this from. What drew me to this picture to start with, the one I'm painted, is that lighting, that catch of, he's got cast shadows falling across his body in the tree, and then there's sections of his body that are catching intense light, and sections of his body that are being blocked out by uh, cast shadows from another tree. And that's what really drew, drew me to this painting. So I want to make sure that I really impose or, or uh, illustrate this, if you will, uh, in my painting, because if it's what, if, if it's what drew me to the reference. It needs to be what draws me to the final painting. So I'm making sure that my contrast here is quite high, but my contrast, not only dark and light, but my contrast in warm and cools. You'll see how I've used a lot of yellows and siennas in the upper body, whereas as I got to the bottom part of the body, which you can see is in shadow, I've used a lot more of the uh, raw umbers and uh, added in yellows and blues to make kind of bluey greens into the fur, which will really establish the, the feel and the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the depth of shadowing, if you will.
Now, to really make sure that we get that sense of glow with the uh, that glow of the fur where the sun is really catching the uh, the squirrel, we're also going to have to make sure that we use very intense colors. And that brings me to the subject of vibrance. How to get a good glowing feel is you have to have the contrast of both a very vibrant color and a very dull color. Okay, so you can see all those reds and oranges in the squirrel. They're very vibrant. They're very saturated colors. They're, they're full of intense color. And that's why I actually applied the very cool um, violety blue color behind the squirrel here because in the reference let's bring that back up again you can see that you got a lot of difference you got a tree you got the you got the black background with some of the blues coming through i didn't want all that action i really liked the um, the harmony of using the browns but i wanted to keep it extremely cool and why i did that is it's that's what's making all of these bright intense colors bright and intense because they're contrasting with the cool flatness of the background. So when you're painting, try to keep in mind that it's not just darks and lights. Um, one of the big things I see too is if somebody wants to uh, lighten the color up, they add white into it, which is a big no-no. And let me emphasize or elaborate on that. What I mean by no-no is, yes, of course, we use white to uh, lighten the color in most instances, but white and black, they suck the life out of color on their own. They're very chalky, especially white. White has a real way of chalking down color. So if I'm lightening a color up and I put a little titanium white in it, I'm always enhancing it by adding in a punch color. And what I mean by a punch color is an intense yellow, an intense red, an intense orange, usually something that's on the warm side of the um, uh, color wheel. Okay, so that's really a, a very important thing to keep in mind when you're mixing and when you're trying to establish what color to lay on what to create a really glowing effect because that contrast of intensity is so, so, so important. So with my uh, my basic shape and form uh, finished, I'm very much so liking his proportioning, his sizing, um, where the lights are, where the darks are. So the color placement I'm very happy with. So now that I'm happy with the shape and form, which is remember the foundation of any painting is you have to have that well established and worked out first. Now I can start concentrating on doing transition colors. And what transitioning is, is it's really softening the transition from one color to the next. Now that doesn't just mean lights and darks. Like lights and darks are extremely important, especially when you're trying to create a glowing light source where uh, half of our squirrels in light, half of our squirrels in shadow. But you also want to concentrate uh, yourself with the transition of warms to cools too, okay? So do you see a recurring theme here on the painting? The real key to glowing fur is one, to have a good transition of darks and lights to establish that, that opposing ends of the spectrum. But you also have to have a really strong um, uh, um, contrast of warms and cools. Okay. So now I can start breaking up my larger areas and the more videos of mine you watch, the more you'll see that there's a, a real um, method to my build up, my break up, and my detailing. So if you establish an area that has really good shape and form, then you can contest, uh, uh, concern yourself with doing the detailing. I would not even think about doing any of the detailing that I'm starting to do now 
if the squirrel didn't have a strong foundation of the, the proper structure, proper proportioning, okay? And now, uh, it's also a lot easier to take a larger area, uh, paint in its local color, its most defined color, uh, put some little transitioning strokes so that we get a little bit of a, a flare from one color to the next, and then break it up with smaller, shorter, more controlled um, strokes. Why? Because one, it looks clean. That's how us professional artists get that clean look. And I hear that term clean so often that people, they really uh, uh, communicate to me that they don't seem to be able to get that clean look that their paintings seem to tend to look muddied and overworked. And overworked is the key word there, is that most of the time that's exactly what's happening is they're overworking areas. Instead of preparing an area, setting up a shape and form, creating a nice subtle transition or softening between the two colors, and then using simple strokes to break up that area to create the detail, they try to paint the detail in stroke for stroke for stroke right from the get-go and uh, even though you do want a lot of layering in your painting if you do too much paint uh, oh, um, layering or build up of color you start to get a really muddied muddled look and that's when it, has, it tends to lack uh, intensity it has tends to lack any kind of punch. So try to think out your paintings. That's where I'm going with this long-winded explanation is that I am constantly thinking about, okay, work this area up, prepare it, set its local color, set its uh, shape and form so that it's moving, it's turning, it's doing whatever it needs to be doing in that particular area, and then hit it with the detail and break it up. So always think ahead, always think in steps, and when you're doing glowing fur, that is even more important because one of the keys to uh, doing a, a really intense light source is there's tends to be a lot more detail in the lighted areas than in the shadows. Now, does that mean I'm not going to paint any detail in my shadows? Of course not. It just means that I am going to have a lot more elaborate detailing in my highlighted areas where the light source is good and the ability to see that detail is increased because of the intense light. And I'm going to put just slightly less detail in the shadows because, of course, what's happening is our ability to see that detail has been diminished because the light is not as intense we're not getting as much of a lit area so we don't see as much detail so when you're painting because that's happening in nature in your reference you have to translate that to your board so that means if I see more detail in my highlights put more detail in your highlights so don't uh, forget about your shadows, but always make sure that your highlighted areas, they have the real punch, the real impact, um, the real heavy detail and the draw. The uh, I, I, I tend to find that the more detailed something is, the more it draws the eye. And that also leads to another trick that comes to mind of to contain people into a painting, one of the tricks is to have a lot of detail in a corner, especially if you have a corner with a sharp line that's taking the viewer off the board. Well, the one way to contain him from his view going right off that board and not coming back into your painting is to add something very detailed in that corner that contains them into the painting, okay? So there's a little, little trick, a little tip for you that's kind of off the glowing fur area, but nevertheless, a great tip to know when you're uh, uh, putting the tips and techniques into your painting arsenal. Now what I'm doing here is just putting a light wash over the whole area and that just softens everything and gives it a little bit of a, a unity. Washes are a great tool in our, uh, in our painting arsenal. Uh, a light wash can really soften an area and just take that little edge off. Sometimes your colors, you haven't laid them just perfect. You've laid them just a little too intense in the contrast and there's just a little too much of a jump from one color to the next. So a wash is a great way of just down toning all of that uh, 
that detail without washing it out. Um, I've had people ask me, can you use airbrush to do that? Absolutely. But in this case, the area, the area, area is just so small and I want the washes to be so contained that I'm better off using a brush than trying to uh, mask off an area and use an airbrush. Now, if it was a larger area where I didn't have to really worry about masking and overspray, absolutely, give it a whirl. Uh, my my attitude towards airbrush is always, if it's going to help the situation, then I use it. If it's not, I don't use it. I have to have a really good use, a reason to use airbrush, okay? Because uh, a I get the question about airbrush so often of why did you use a lot of it uh, when you were younger like uh, my power to paint videos from 15 years ago you would have seen a lot of airbrush in it where there's hardly any now well that's because I've learned over the years how to refine my style to get a lot of those effects that I was getting with an airbrush out of a brush now and out of a brush gives a more painterly look whereas an airbrush gives a more high realism look so it just depends on the, the look you're going for so wash is good airbrush good it's whatever floats your boat but uh, unfortunately you will not see any airbrush whatsoever in this video <laughs> Now here I'm adding very subtle little warm streaks and what I mean is if you take a good look you'll see that it's got a little bit of an orangey tinge to it and that's because even though this bottom half is in shadow our shadow is still going to have some uh, shots of warms and vice versa up in our warms I've got little shots of uh, cool browns and that's to help uh, establish that an area is cool or is warm by having something to contrast against it. The only reason why something looks like it's glowing is because there's something around it that is not glowing, that is cool, that has uh, uh, softer colors. If you made the whole board intense, it loses that sense of glow because everything is glowing. And that's where composition can really come in to play a big role too, is composition just doesn't come down to uh, making sure you're uh, incorporating your uh, golden ratio, your thirds, your elements, your principles. It's also establishing, do I have enough information in here to let the viewer know what's going on. And in this case, we're talking about glowing light sources. Do I have enough darks in my painting so that they have, so that the glowing, the, the warm glow has something to contrast against so then people know and can identify that it is glowing. If I created the composition of this painting to have um, just all glowing, let's bring up the reference again. That's what really drew me to this, is that there's that contrast of warms and cools, of darks and lights, okay? So when you're composing your painting, not don't just keep your colors and your, your elements, your principles in mind, all that stuff. Keep in mind that you have to show the opposing ends of a spectrum, which means to get really intense lights, you have to have really intense darks and vice versa. So don't forget the two of them. All right, so as I'm putting in the last little bit of details in this painting, uh, I want to go over a couple of things. So to get a good glow, what you need is a contrast of darks and lights, a good contrast of warms and cools. Try to put a little more detail in your highlights. You can see here that even uh, down in my shadowed areas, I've got detail, but there is definitely much more up on those, those yellows, oranges, and reds of the top of the body than there is on the bottom, okay? And that's one way to really draw your attention to the, the highlighted uh, areas. Uh, try to lay your warmer subject matter on a cooler background. That'll really help to shoot them out, as you can see here. So those are the basics of doing a glow. Um, I'm going to do the uh, tree next and we'll learn how to do some really good bark and how to, again, do some glowing 
warms and darks um warms and darks uh warms and cools and darks and lights on the uh, tree so we'll give it a real sense of lighted and not lit and that'll reinforce our glow effect okay so please do not forget to uh, subscribe to like it and to share the video and until the next time everybody be good to each other stay safe and happy painting